Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar this morning, the business diversification and how to use it effectively. As a quick reminder, all attendees are muted and videos are shut off. However, we'd love for you to engage with our presenters today by using the chat feature found at the bottom of your screen. You can find that chat feature by clicking on the three dots on the bottom of your screen if you're on a mobile device or by selecting chat if you're joining from a desktop computer. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce our experts on the call today, David Widmar and Dr. Brent Gloy, co-founders of Agricultural Economic Insights, and our very own Jennifer Ferris, Senior Financial Officer at Farm Credit Mid-America. Uh, with significant lending experience and her experience of managing her own farming operation, Jennifer will discuss some of the best practices she's worked, she's seen work, not only for her own operation, but also for all the customers that she works with as well. As a reminder, this webinar is intended for informational purposes only and is not for public or media consumption, and any opinions expressed by the presenters are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of Farm Credit Mid-America. So with that, thank you all so much for joining us this morning. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded and distributed following uh, the event, so if you're not able to stick with us the entire time, no worries. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Brent, and you guys can take it away. Well, thanks, Micah. I'll jump in here and get us kicked off today. Uh, we're really excited about this topic. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, hopefully, you're finding someplace cool this morning to, to stream this from. But business diversification, the title today is, is what is it exactly and how do I effectively use it in my operation? And, and business diversification is kind of one of those management ideas or management concepts that um, we hear discussed and talked about a lot. We kind of intuitively know the importance of not putting all of our eggs in the same basket, but what does that really mean? And how do we actually evaluate uh, how, we, how we're how we doing as an operation? How do we go about growing our business in a way that creates that, that business diversification that allows us to, to spread out those that risk and to still have effective gains? So we're going to, today's webinar, we're going to unpack sort of how this works. Brent and I are going to get into some of the the technical theoretical details and provide a few examples and best practices for deploying it on your operation. And then Jennifer is going to join us here and share some of her experiences about how you can deploy that uh, on your own operation. So to get started today, I want to set up a sort of a base example. And we're going to build off this as we move through. And for a lot of a lot of us, we can easily think of an operation as sort of a single enterprise. Maybe right now you're only raising cattle or only raising corn, for an example. And so if you look back at your business over the last 10 years, for example, you might see that on average, you have a return of around 5%. And so this could be relevant to your, your business or maybe investment in a stock market. But you see over the last 10 years, you have a 5% return. And maybe you're pretty happy with that. That's uh, a rate of return that you can live with. But the concern here and the concern that really comes to mind for a lot of us is not the average return. The average can be deceiving. It's these year over year variations. And so you see in this stream of returns, we had conditions as high as 9% or, or, or 8 7% in a few years and as low as 2% or 0%. So it's years 3, 4, and 7 that really give us some pause when we're a manager of this operation because we still have obligations to meet. We still have maybe uh, a family living expense to cover and that gets really difficult. And so there's a lot of ways that we can um, work in our operation to help weather those downturns. But we want to talk a little bit about how diversification can help you uh, weather those, those downturns. Now, one thing to really keep in mind is if we think about this operation sort of as it is today and we wanted to grow it, uh, sometimes diversification comes in, we want to expand the operation. If you were to just double down on the current level of activity, so if you have a thousand acres of corn and you're just going to add a thousand more acres of corn, you're still going to see this risk portfolio, right? It's just going to be bigger numbers, but you're still going to see these high highs and these low lows. And so this is you know, why diversification has some opportunities is that we want to grow the business in a slightly different way to helpfully take out some of that downturn. So let's talk a little bit about uh, correlation. Correlation is often the way we think about uh, diversifying investments. And correlation is simply uh, a measure. It spans from negative one to positive one. And it tells us how related our two are the performances of, of two um, comparable items. So the 
horizontal axis over here uh, might represent uh, investment in maybe Apple stock, and, and this one over here might represent investment in Google stock, for example. And each of these dots represents, you know, the performance of one versus the performance of the other. And you look at all these years of data, and you can see we add a trend line through here, and this is considered positive correlation. Now, the tighter all of those line, those dots are to the line, the closer to, to one we might see this, this correlation play out. Now, on the other hand, we have things that have, are negatively correlated. So maybe over here we have, you know, temperatures and number of people ice skating, right? So as temperature goes up, the number of people ice skating is, is going to go down. Uh, we would expect that over time. And then, of course, there's other, so this might have a correlation between zero and negative one. And then um, here we have a situation that has no correlation. So the correlation measure is going to be close to zero, and we see there's just not a whole lot of, of relationship between these two uh, conditions. They're just not too closely related. One of the ways that we see this a lot of times play out in, in agriculture is we see folks looking at the returns of farmland. So this is from the NICRI uh, in index of farmland performance. And so it is includes some row crop production, but also uh, other investments in, in crops, uh, such as fruit, nuts, and vegetables. But it looks at the valuations of the property, but also the annual returns that come into that. And it compares it as a correlation to other investments that you might be making. Uh, and so you think about, well, the correlation between farmland and U.S. Treasuries here, the 10-year bonds, this is uh, close to zero, but it's negative. And you can see that with corporate bonds, it's negative 0.2. And then it's also for gold, it's positive 0.2. And so oftentimes we see correlation measures from, again, negative 1.0 to positive one is the range, but we don't always see them at these extreme cases. It's more common to see them, uh, we focus on the directionality of them and also the magnitude, and the magnitude doesn't have to be, you know, all the way up to positive one or negative one to still have a lot of connections and relationships over time. So I'm gonna bring these two ideas, this variability in annual returns and this idea of correlation and say, well, how do we deploy uh, diversification into our business. And so the question that we have here is, is it possible to expand my business and minimize the year-to-year -year volatility? So the baseline investment, that's what we talked about earlier. Uh, this is say 50% of the business and we're considering adding this second enterprise or the second investment that's another 50%. And what we've done here is we've made the correlation here at negative one. This is a hypothetical. We're probably never gonna see this in reality. Um, but the idea here is these two activities uh, tend to not follow the same pattern. In fact, they follow the opposite pattern. Um, and so when one's really high, like we saw in investment one at 8%, investment number two has pretty low returns. And then when we saw investment number one uh, really low, we had the opposite situation play out. So what we wanna see here is how can we get these two things to really help offset each other? And the way this works in this theoretical textbook example is if we were to turn around and say, okay, what is my average annual return? So let's just say I hypothetically um, put in $100. What's gonna be my average return? Well, we're still gonna get this 5% average return over those 10 years. But the idea now here is that we're going to be able to benefit and streamline and smooth that out just a little bit. So the best years aren't nearly as good. We don't have these years that have 9% annual returns, uh, but we don't have these bad years where things really dip. Again, reality is never all this, uh, never this clean. This is hypothetical, but the idea here is to get us to start thinking about uh, what's our underlying business look like? Um, how is it how do we unconnect or disconnect these long run returns versus these year to year variations? And these year to year variations can oftentimes uh, create some, some challenges for us. How do we think about the role of diversification and what does it mean when we add these alternative investments and alternative enterprises to our business to help grow that and scale that out? So Brent, I'm gonna turn this over to you and have you talk a little bit about, you know, what does it mean to be, what does it mean when we add diversification to our business and how does that impact it and some of the, the cautious uh, cautions to keep an eye out for. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I think maybe it was just the thing growing up on the on the Great Plains. David and I both grew up in that re region of the world. And uh, I remember uh, going to college and you'd introduce yourself and tell a little bit where you're from and your classes. And people always say, well, I'm from a diversified 
grain and livestock farm. And uh, that word diversified was in most people's uh, definition. Dave, Dave is the one that brought it up. He says, was that just me or what? And I'm like, no, I think that's kind of the way it was uh, when you think back about it. And over time, we kind of moved toward uh, probably a lot more specialization. I know if you think about the farms that a lot of you grew up with, they probably look a lot more specialized today than they did in the past. And uh, I would say that that is also true throughout the economy in general. We seem to go through these kind of cycles or trends toward, you know, diversified uh, conglomerate type businesses to uh, businesses that aren't, you know, they're very specialized. And then it, it, that pendulum kind of swings back and forth. And uh, I'm hearing more and more talk about diversification now in, in the ag sector. And, and part of the reason is, you know, why, why is that? Well, I think part of it is um, we push the specialization pretty far. And now I think people are thinking about, well, is there any way I can get some of that diversification benefit or that get all the eggs out of that one basket kind of thing? Um, you know, for every person says, don't put all your eggs in one basket, then there's somebody else say, well, you know, put all your eggs in one basket, just guard it really carefully. And, and so that doesn't defeat the, even if you watch it really carefully, uh, they're all still in one basket. And so anytime we can get correlation less than one, um, meaning perfectly correlated, we get some benefit to it. And, um, you know, I used to always think, well, in, in agriculture, they're all crops. If, if corn's down, probably all the other crops are going to be down. And, and I think to some extent that's true, but they're probably not um, – down maybe as much or they're down different amounts, maybe some of them more. It just depends. And if you think about it, part of the reason is um, the biological processes are a little bit different. So the same weather and things that impact one crop uh, might impact another differently. Then we've got things like um, we can think about where can we find correlation less than one? Well, you got the Main Street economy as a possibility. Businesses on Main Street uh, are going to have slightly different economic factors, I think, than the farm economy. And so anytime we can add something less than one, we're going to get some benefit. Another obvious example is when David puts rainy season versus dry season crops. And uh, I even think about it as spring versus versus fall crops. So if you think about wheat versus corn, well, um, there is different, you know, weather factors at play when wheat's growing. There's different market forces on the wheat prices. So you get that benefit. You also get um, some benefit of changing your cash flow patterns a little bit that come with it. So I think it's something to think about. The other thing you get is stability. The other, the other way to find diversification, the other benefit of it is stability. So I think about um, savings accounts, CDs, um, those, those returns to those kind of investments are stable and they come in. It's kind of that old deal where, you know, you say, well, we want to have a portfolio of 60% stocks and 40% bonds. And then we kind of went away from that. And I see debates about that even to this day. But those kind of more stable um, investments provide you kind of that consistent annual return. Maybe not as high, but provide some, remove some of that volatility. On the farm side, we can think about doing things like, oh, Maybe we insource some of these activities such as spraying. We do that uh, ourselves rather than hiring it out. Or we can provide some of that stability by doing some custom farming activities. That's another way to get kind of a stable, steady uh, cash flow and earnings uh, into our operation that, that doesn't move up and down nearly as much as, say, crop returns. Um, the other thing I think when we think about diversification that we get is something that's really important. That's um, trying to provide what we call asymmetric outcomes. And that's just a fancy way of saying something 
that pays off in really bad states of nature. So when really bad things happen, we get a payoff. But what are some examples of that? The most obvious one is insurance. So you have a big problem, insurance that you're gonna have a lot lower cash flow, insurance comes in and provides a payment. That is the classic example of an asymmetric outcome. Why don't people purchase those? Well, they tend to cost money over time. So you pay a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. But if they ever pay off, they're probably going to pay more in one year than you've paid in premiums for quite some time. So they can be really helpful. Um, another obvious example of that are options, say, in commodity markets. Um, why don't people buy options? Because there's premium costs that go with it. And so you pay out, pay out, pay out, pay out, uh, and people get tired of paying those premiums. Um, but if the bad thing happens, you get a very large payout. And so I think asymmetric outcomes is something we all need to think about in our business. What happens to our return profile when something really bad happens in one of our businesses? Another one that David came up with is the idea of, say, buying farmland with development potential. Um, may seem like a lot more expensive at one point, but uh, over time, it's got the potential to provide a really, really big payout uh, in, in the future. So um, higher returns, uh, things that improve um, annual returns and diversification, like marketing your stored grain or, you know, a cow-calf producer owning cattle and putting them in a feedlot, all, all examples of diversification. And we talked yesterday, we were talking through this, there's also a lot of things you can do around agritourism and some of those other, other um, areas that can help add diversification to your operation. So what do you want to watch out for? Um, and I think there's a few things. I would be very careful of just adding enterprises for the sake of adding them. Uh, it shouldn't be an excuse to add distractions. So, uh, again, think about what's the goal. And, and we always want to think about doing one thing really well is probably better than doing five things and doing them all average <laughs> or below average. So we want to make sure that if we're adding an operation, uh, we're going to be able to do it well, and it's not going to detract from um, from our other activities. So think through, okay, what's the starting point? What's the goal? What's it going to take to get uh, to be really good at it? The other thing is um, sometimes we say, well, we're diversifying, and we end up diversifying into something that's like David showed in those graphs correlated. So um, the, re the benefit of adding uh, soybeans to a corn farm in Indiana is probably pretty marginal in terms of diversification. It might have a whole bunch of other benefits. And I, and I, I wouldn't say it's completely, um, I would say it's also adds a little bit of diversification as well. But um, but if you're doing it just to diversify, I think that you want to maybe think about things that aren't quite uh, as highly correlated. I think if you do it right, diversification is going to have trade-offs. And we've said this before, you know, uh, economics in many ways is that, and I studied it because I hate making trade-offs. I was hoping there was some secret that I could learn that would help me avoid making trade-offs, but they always have tr clear trade-offs. So if you're getting into something that's really negatively correlated, it's probably gonna be a lot more work and it's probably gonna be, take a lot more learning and knowledge to figure out how to do it well. Uh, if you get into something that has a really high annual it's probably going to have in lies the lower average return. Lower, if you get want that lower volatility, it's going to probably not have as high a return. So adding it during lean times is pretty risky. We need to understand the underlying economics. And um, so at the end of the day, you know, diversification, I think, can be a really good tool for a lot of our businesses because we've tended to get really specialized here in the last, I don't know, say 20 years. And so I think there's room for diversification. We just want to do it well. Um, 
I guess, David, I'm, I'm at the time limit, I believe. It's probably time to bring Jennifer in. Yeah, Brent, thanks for, for that. And Jennifer, thank you for helping us prepare for today's event and looking forward to the conversation here with you. Um, to kick things off, to share a little about yourself and your role with the association. I've been with Farm Credit Mid America for about 10 years. Um, I am located just an hour north of Nashville, Tennessee, and I work with grain farmers, cattlemen, um, tobacco farmers. I was actually raised on a tobacco, grain, and cattle farm here in Logan County. And um, in over my tenure with Farm Credit, I've worked with several Amish and Mennonites. I work with large grain farmers. Um, my favorite segment, though, is probably working with our Growing Forward um, customers, watching them just start their operation and uh, develop their business plan and watch their dreams come true. And it's really exciting talking about this, this topic of diversification. So glad well, to be great. here. Well, great. When we started preparing on a call a week or two ago, you asked me a question. I'm going to turn the question back around on you. You said, are we talking about ag versus non-ag diversification opportunities? So, you know, tell us a little bit about what your thoughts are about, you know, some of these opportunities, especially in that non-ag space. Yes. Well, Farm Credit is here to serve, obviously, agriculture and to serve our rural communities. That is our mission, and that's what we do. But quite often, people don't understand that, you know, diversifying into what is called a non-ag segment could be like rental properties, uh, commercial buildings. Uh, we can actually help our farmers diversify their income in that way as well, and we can do the lending on that. Um, specifically in our area and across the association, you know, we talk about earnings that come from um, non-ag. You can think about that from off-farm income possibly, uh, commercial buildings like we talked about, shopping centers that are in rural communities. We can even do urban areas as well, but we've, we've got a little bit more restriction on those types of financing. But rental properties, apartments, we've seen those kind of take off in the last little bit. But diver diversification looks very different in many different segments, I guess. It was great because as I was preparing slides, I was very focused on, you know, corn versus soybeans versus livestock and even tobacco, as you mentioned, but like there's a whole lot of other opportunities out there. And I think that off-farm income piece is a, an entirely different opportunity of diversification. It's that stable stream of income that comes in and uh, can really help that, that farm household uh, situation. You mentioned a specific case of ag diversification that I want to spend a little time talking about. It's around market diversification. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, so um, well, when I'm talking about just diversifying in general, you know, I think it's important to treat it as a new segment, developing a business plan, developing an understanding of labor, um, how it coincides or how it collaborates with your current operation. Uh, having those details prepared, I think, is very important. Um, some other ways that I know for us on our farm, uh, which I didn't really go into in my introduction, but on our farm here in Logan County, my husband and I, we actually have kind of a homestead. So we actually sell direct to consumer our meats. Um, we have lamb, uh, we have chickens, we have uh, beef cattle. And so we are a pasture-based farm, uh, even though, I, although I grew up on a commercial farm, we kind of took the different route to go of the homestead. And so we sell direct to consumer. And many of you guys may be thinking, how can I diversify? And, you know, roadside stands, agritourism, we've talked about that. Those are things that can easily be implemented into a farm. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, you have the labor, you have the management. And I think the market of um, consumers wanting to know and be connected to their farm is important so great appreciate that putting your lender hat on for a, a second here what are some if you're having a conversation with a producer who wants to expand their business or talking about diversifying into something new uh, what are some of the warning signs or like the red lights and what are some of the caution signs or the yellow lights and then the green lights that you might hear come up in that conversation that gives you some some 
thought or some uh, feedback for that operation? Yeah, if I'm sitting across the table from a producer and you know they want to take a huge leap into uh, something completely different and they want to quit, you know, maybe a spouse wants to quit their off-farm job or something like that, that's I'm very cautious about that. Um, you know, I understand that you've got to take some risks to have some gain, but I think that's kind of risky to, to let go of that consistent income. And I think, you know, you've got to work into it. And I think communication amongst partners and amongst people that are in the operation is very, very important. The stability of that off-farm income is, it kind of takes away, you know, from the, from the earnings. And so I caution that I have a red light on that. Um, a yellow light would be, you know, someone has come in and they, they have their research done, you know. Um, they're not, well, they haven't done their research and they're not getting specific um, on the alignment with the diversification. Um, I want to see details. And so a green light would be, you know, having a financial statement, having uh, a budget, really. Um, maybe it's a budget that has worst case scenario uh, to the best case scenario, and then you're having something that's maybe midline projections. So we want to know um, how it's going to align with the operation, but then what are you projecting and how are you going to market this and how are you going to be engaged um, with, with the, the diversified enterprise? I like how that ties in with something you mentioned earlier, sort of a, it's, you have to have a plan for this specific enterprise and you have to have the data and the tracking at the enterprise level to see is this successful and how is it performing. We just can't lump all these things together. It's going to take more management to unlock the power of this diversification. We have to upgrade our management capacities to really implement that and to measure it and to record it. Are there times or periods in a in an operations life cycle where you hear more conversation about or more interest around this diversification come up? Um, there are two scenarios that I um, people talk about diversification, and one would be if it's a producer that has a lot of working capital and they want to invest in something, um, they know their money can grow and they see an opportunity. Um, the second would be, you know, for our young and beginning farmers, that adding the next generation into an operation. Um, you know, that's a hot topic. Um, we serve a lot of our growing forward customers and help them develop that business plan. But I think for those that are bringing in the next generation, the earlier you communicate interest in getting in the operation, but then the more uh, the current producer that's you know wanting to bring in the next generation, that communication I think is super important. So my last question for you today, doesn't have to relate to our topic here around business diversification, but if there is a piece of advice that you could put on a billboard for thousands of producers to see and think about here in July of 2024, what would that message be? Um, my message would be, uh, and it's a little bit different than what it was yesterday, but um, working capital. Um, working capital at the top of your balance sheet um, gives you the power to make those diversification decisions, um, it allows you to make those decisions and for you to be in control of that. You know, you're not going to a lender having to ask, hey, can I do this? You know, you have the power and you've worked to do that. And I think setting up that next generation to understand saving your working capital, having funds, um, money, if that's what you want to do, um, it, takes, it takes money, it takes working capital to make those investments. And so I think that's um, something that the next generation needs to know. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. That's all very, very insightful. We're going to kick it over to Micah, and Brent's going to join us again, and we're going to uh, open it up to all the questions here that have been coming through from the audience today. The first thing that I was hoping to, to cover was uh, around this agritourism uh, sector. And uh, Jennifer, from your perspective, do you see a lot of upside or potential in this area? I had two questions come in. Uh, the first one was, uh, what should I do with a with a small hundred acre um, you know farm that I have? And then the second one was, do you see a lot of upside in agritourism? I wonder if there's some correlation there, and um, and uh, what your thoughts are from from what you see out in the field. 
I think when you look at our consumers, uh, they want to experience things. They want to be connected to the farm. Uh, I know for us, like last Friday, we had a, a group come in to from a homeschool uh, homeschool group. Um, they wanted to experience the farm, and so I think that we're so consumers are so detached from the farm. They want to have an experience on the farm, and I think agritourism is a good idea. Um, I think there are risks with that. Uh, I think you need to be able to take look at insurance, look at management, look at labor. Um, they're all items that you need to look at if you're interested in it. But I think educating people about agriculture is very important. Um, they need to see a chicken. They need to see um, our cows, how we're raising them, all that stuff. I think it's a good segment. Um, the next question that I have uh, that came up is, how does diversification uh, relate to maybe estate planning? And I know we had kind of a conversation around that yesterday, um, but from all three of you, any thoughts on that? You want me to go first, I can? Yeah. Um, sure, and I, I think when you when you start doing that, that planning around the estate, there's there are some benefits to having the diversification in the sense that um, it might give space, help give space if you have more than one um, heir or, or child or whatever, whoever you're trying to, to pass that estate to, uh, to find their own, you know, niche and, and grow that part of the operation and sometimes that's really valuable just for for the development of your your heirs um to have something they can manage without you know big brother or little brother telling them what to do all the time so uh um not that that ever happens uh but but i think that there's there's definitely some benefit to that uh to building that kind of diversified set of operations um, from from an estate standpoint. And David, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. One thing that comes to my mind around this is um, different risk preferences oftentimes come up when you start to think about the transition. And so the incumbent generation, the, the older generation um, is thinking about wealth preservation and they're thinking about how do I make sure that there's something to pass over and to, that they can live the rest of their career out. So they might be sort of cautious to take on these new opportunities that take one investment, that two have a lot of uncertainty, and three might come with a lot of risk, but also a lot of growth opportunities. Uh, and then that younger generation might be um, more, so they might be thinking about like, oh, how do I get stable income, like a CD or a savings account or an off-farm income? And this new generation might be thinking about higher returns, right? So how do we make sure we can grow the pie so that they can have a future and a long career in this operation? And so they're young, younger, and they're, you know, have a long career ahead of them. There's a lot of roll of the dice, so to speak. And so they can sort of see a lot of opportunities in, in and expanding and taking on new risks and new areas and to build new skill sets. So I think that can sometimes be uh, a, a source of stress or contention. But I think just stepping back, having these conversations and doing, you know, hearing everybody out and thinking about a plan that sort of addresses all those concerns is, is important and can be vital, vital to moving forward. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. Oh. I was just going to say communication is key when you're talking about estate planning, um, but also letting, giving buy-in to the next generation, you know, letting them feel connected to the heritage, the legacy, I think is important for when you're thinking about the next generation and estate planning. Yeah, having, having those financial assets too can be really beneficial in, in the estate planning the standpoint of maybe all the heirs don't want to be involved in the farm and uh, having those financial assets that provide stability, as David was talking about, but also provide a route for for maybe them to be compensated there and, and not have the farm. Because like David said, the risk preferences can be really different. And um, 
you know, making someone a partner in a farm that doesn't want all that goes with it uh, is probably not going to be a long-term solution. The last question that I want to cover is just around uh, developing a business plan. And um, Jennifer, I, I'll turn it over to you to kind of uh, start us off. But I do want to highlight that for anybody on the call, if they do want a template to be able to start that process, um, they can find Farm Credit Mid America's business plan on our website. So if you go to fcma.com and, and search for the Growing Forward program, uh, within there, you will find a template that kind of helps you start to maybe think through um, the questions and the, the thoughts that you may have as, as thinking about diversifying your operation or, or building out a, a business from the, the ground up. So with that, Jennifer, any um, thoughts or, or questions that you often get that may help um, the individual that kind of asks that question as they think about developing that business plan for the first time? Yeah. Um when when they first look at the business plan, I think they, they feel overwhelmed. Like there's a lot of boxes to be filled out and a lot of questions that they may think are, you know, I, I know this already. Um, but I think writing it down on paper helps you see your strengths and your weaknesses. I think it helps you see, plan out opportunities um, and threats, um, things that you may, writing it out I think helps you helps you see it and understand who you are. Um, the, the most detailed part is going to be that cash flow. And so making sure, that's what I tell people is the most important part. Seeing your strengths and weaknesses is good, but making sure you understand that cash flow and how it's going to um, benefit you. And when I was speaking earlier, you know, cash flow of, of projection, what it's going to look like, you know, at the, the best case scenario for you, the worst case scenario, and even just, hey, if I could just do this. You know, I think those those details are important. And so that's what that business plan allows our customers to do. Again, they feel overwhelmed, but I think if they have somebody that walks through, walks them through, um, using your network of people, I think is very important, which is what we talked about yesterday. Um, us as loan officers, you know, your seed, your fertilizer guy, those are all people that make you a better person. And so that's what us loan officers are for, is to help get that on paper for you. And it's something that I love to do for our growers. I can't write it for you, but I can help you help you get it down, you know? I think that's an excellent, excellent way to close this out. So thank you so much. That uh, um, at the end of the day, the reason we do these webinars is to be able to provide value to all of our listeners, but also to highlight that uh, we want to be more than just your lender. We want to be on your board of directors and we want to support you through these business endeavors. And so um, utilize the resources that we have. We have an incredible team across all the states that we serve and uh, folks just like Jennifer out in the retail offices ready to kind of support and work through uh, doing a cash flow for the very first time or sitting down and talking through a business plan. Um, it's really our mission and, and it's what our team really enjoys doing. So uh, we hope that you'll take advantage of these opportunities, and thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, there will be a recording of this webinar in your inbox soon, and it can also be found on FCMA's website under the business of farming. So thank you all so much, and we look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.